Top three random cars with serial killers. Experts believe in the United States alone, there are at least 2,000 active, uncaught serial killers just running wild. Which means if you live in America, you may have already had an interaction with a serial killer. Hey, to all my American uh, friends watching, you better run. You better run. There's 2,000 active that haven't been caught. 2,000? You just didn't know it. But today, I'm going to share three progressively more disturbing cases of Americans Yo! that had an... Bro, that's a lot of Netflix documentaries coming out over the next few years. That's a lot of documentaries coming out. ...interaction with a serial killer, but came to find out later that it was a serial killer. But before we get into those stories, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, I know, and some mysterious are... delivered in story oh, format... Oh, yeah, what if one of you guys right are one? Because that's all I do, and I upload three, four, even five times every week. So if that's of interest to you, then please schedule the like button for a fight with Paul on the day before Thanksgiving in... Yo, chat, out of curiosity, is anyone here a serial killer? Quincy, Massachusetts. Also, please subscribe to my channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of my weekly uploads. All right, let's... Hair is no bass. After spending 21 years in the U.S. Army, a man retires and moves to Central Florida with his wife and young son. Although his family had plenty of money because he had a pension coming in and his wife still worked full time, he just got bored really quickly after moving to Central Florida and decided he would just take a job doing something just to stay occupied. And so he ended up taking a job at a highway gas station. One of the primary reasons he chose this particular job is because the owners of the gas station didn't care if his son came along to help him stock shelves and hang out behind the cash register. And so for years, that's just how it went. The man would work at the gas station and his son would tag along. Even after his son became a teenager and you'd think might be wanting to do other things, well, the town was so small, there was almost nothing to do. So his son still came along well into his teenage years. One night in 1990, his son, who was 15 years old at the time, was at the station and he was actually taking a break sitting outside on a picnic table. He was- You know what, chat? I actually don't know how, but like even friends of mine, they will say I got nothing to do. How does any, like chat, I don't know if I've just lived a different life to other people. Does anyone relate? But there's never been a day where I've not had anything to do. In fact, I feel like I have too much to do. I don't have time to not do something. You know what I mean? Bro, like I don't, I've, I've never understood that. How does someone not have anything to do? There's a million things, bro. I don't know. I don't know. It's always interesting me when, like, even my mates have been like, oh, I got nothing to do. I'm like, what? <laughs> There's always something, mate. Reading a magazine, drinking a Mountain Dew, and, you know, it's dark out, and he notices out of the corner Wait, of his eye kids? that uh, there is a woman <laughs> walking change? off of the highway towards the gas station. It was a very quiet night at the time, so there's no cars well, getting creepy. gas, there's nobody there, and there's not really anybody even driving on the highway, and so that's why she really stood out to him. And he turns and he notices her, and he thinks to himself, you know, no one ever walks to our gas station. We're on a highway. Everybody drives here. So she must have broken down, and she must be coming here to try to use our phone to call a tow truck or something like that. So the woman- Oh, you got a good point james it's not that they don't have anything to do it's that they don't want they've got nothing they want to do okay so it's just it's just a mindset it's a mindset so whereas like my mind i've always got to be doing something where someone else might be like they don't want to do it so they got nothing to do okay 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 good and is walking across the lot coming closer and closer to the gas station and the boy at this point has turned his attention back to his magazine but he would say later that he kept looking up and keeping an eye on her because there was something off about her the woman ultimately walks right behind him and goes in the door into the gas well, station she doesn't creepy. acknowledge the boy doesn't say hi to him just walks straight inside and she starts walking up and down the aisles of the gas station now from where the boy was sitting it's all glass, so he could clearly look in and see his father behind the counter, and he could see the head of this woman as she walked in and around all these aisles. And as soon as the woman was in the store, kind of pacing around the aisles, the boy put his magazine down and was just watching. And he noticed that she was not really shopping. She was just looking down for a few seconds, wouldn't pick anything up, so she wasn't buying anything. And she would look up at the counter where his father was, and she would just stare at him. And then she'd look back down at what she was doing and she would go through all the aisles. And at some point, the woman just kind of abandons this phony, I'm pretending to shop routine and just walks up to the counter. 
Now, nobody else is in the store. There's nobody else coming in. And so the boy could actually fairly clearly hear what she was saying to his father. And she told his father that she had broken down and she needed a ride and could he drive her to Ocala, which was the next big town north of this gas station. And the boy would say that his father acted very strangely because his father is normally incredibly pleasant with all the customers. He's very chatty even. Like he talks to everybody who comes in the store. But as soon as this woman had gone in, his dad had seemed kind of dismissive and almost rude to this woman. And when she was talking to him, asking for a ride, he just said, no, I won't give you a ride. The woman is annoyed by how quickly she's been shot down. But instead of just taking no for an answer, she turns and looks at the boy, the boy who's sitting out on the bench, who's looking right at her. And she points at the boy and she says, what about him? Is he your son? Can he give me a ride? The boy notices that his father, who's not within her eyesight, is looking at his son going, no. Like, whatever she wants from you, you're going to say no to it. And the boy's a little bit confused by this because he's still trying to understand why his dad was that so was against going helping on. this woman because she clearly needs our help or someone's help. But he just took his dad at face value. And when the woman's pointing at him, he knew, the boy, that if she came over and asked him, he would say no. But it wouldn't come to that because the boy's father would say to the woman, no, my son's not going to give you a ride. You need to leave here immediately. Do not come back. Leave. We're not going to help you. She's furious, what? she's cussing him out. She storms out and slams the door. She starts cussing at the boy and she walks off the whole time. She's turning around and flipping them off and screaming profanities at them. But she ultimately walks off and the dad kind of followed her out and is standing next to his son as she walks off. And the boy asks his dad, like, what, what was her deal? Why did that happen? Why did you, why did you not want to help her? And the dad just said, I don't know. There was just something, there was something off about her. And I, I don't know how to place it, but I did not want her around you. I, I knew I didn't want to give her a ride. Well, he got I got weird knew vibes. She had to go. A year later, the boy is in his room when he hears his dad in the other room yelling for him to come in here and look at the TV. So he runs into the TV room and on the TV is the same woman from the gas station, better known as Eileen Warnos. She was a serial killer who used to pick up her male victims at gas stations in Florida. It's unclear whether the boy or the boy's father were her next victim. Oh shit, and the guy knew? Oh shit. Damn, imagine he didn't know. And like he sent the son to help or helped. Yo. But by the time she had shown up at that gas station, she had already killed four people. And following that interaction with them at the gas station, she had gone on to kill three more people, including someone in Ocala, Florida, which was the town she had asked them to give her a ride to. Eileen had Holy been caught, fuck. that's why she was on TV, and she was later sentenced to death. Trust your gut, bro. I don't know if the dad was trusting his gut or he's seen her face and recognized it. But either way, trust your gut, bro. You seem normal. In the late 1970s, a medical student going to school in Chicago had just gotten out of class and decided he didn't want to pay for a taxi. Hey, I'll tell you what ain't normal with that house. What's going on with that house, mate? That's not normal. So he decided he would hitchhike his way home. Now, this was something he routinely did and at the time was socially acceptable. So he goes down to the road and he puts his thumb out and eventually a car pulls up and he would describe the man that is pulling up as looking normal and even friendly and lighthearted. It's a middle-aged guy and he tells the student, hey, come on in, hop in and give you a ride. The student did not feel threatened by this guy and felt like overall this was safe. And so he hops in the passenger seat he tells this man where he wants to go. Do you know what is crazy though? He, like, you can tell this is an American house, yeah? Shall I tell you why? Because even though it looks absolutely terrible and terrifying, it's three times the size of a UK house. You know UK house? They're about this big. It's about it. It's about it. Unless you got more money than the average UK citizen, then you probably got about this big. And then if you're loaded, you got a house this big. That's how the UK works. He says, okay, and they start driving off. So as they're driving, it's silent in the car. They're not making chit chat. They're just driving along. And the student notices that the man misses the turn to go That's where he needs guy to go. Though. And so the student turns to the man and says, hey, you know, you missed, you missed the turn. Do you mind turning around and going back this way? Or, you know, if you want, you can just drop me off here and, and I'm happy to walk. We're not that far away. 
the man who had seemed really nice and lighthearted suddenly had this really intense demeanor come over him. And he turns and looks at the student and goes, oh no, you're coming with me. The student is frozen in fear. He doesn't know what to do, but he knows immediately that this is not an idle threat. I don't know who he is. I don't know what's gonna happen, but it's gonna be bad for me. I have to get out. And so as soon as the car began to slow down, even a little bit, I mean, they're still driving. They're not stopped. Go, the student unlocks the door, opens the car and jumps out of the moving car and smashes into the ground, rolls against the side of the curb, but is ultimately unhurt. I mean, he's banged up from jumping out of a moving car, oh, but he God. was able to stand up and run back to his house. He didn't call the police because he really didn't know what to tell them because he didn't have a great description of the guy. He didn't have his license plate and the guy didn't do anything totally aggressive. It was more of a threat but an ambiguous threat at best. It wasn't really clear what he wanted to do with him. It definitely did not seem good, but it just wasn't enough for him to call the police. And so the student just feels lucky that he got out of there and moves on with his life. A couple of years go by, the student at this point has basically forgotten about this encounter with the stranger. And he's sitting in a cafe, he's drinking some coffee, and there's a TV on behind him. He wasn't paying attention to Could it, be the guy. but the reporter on the TV said something that immediately piqued his interest. The reporter was talking about a guy that was currently on death row that apparently had removed all of the inside car door handles inside of his car after his first would-be victim, a college student, had apparently escaped by opening a car door while he was moving. Oh, the student shit. runs over to the TV and sees on the screen there it's is him. an image of the guy they're talking about, this guy on death row, and it's the same guy who gave him a ride two years earlier. His name was Yo, John Wayne imagine. Gacy, AKA the killer clown. He had killed over 30 men and boys in Chicago. And then after killing them in his clown room, he would stuff them into a secret crawl space in his basement. And although we can't be certain, it seems extremely likely that this med student was supposed to be the first victim of John Wayne Gacy, but he leapt out of the car, forcing John Wayne Gacy Holy to change his strategy. Yo, imagine knowing that you like, was nearly dead by serial killer, bro. Make sure the next person was not able to do that. Um. In the 1970s, a young woman and young man were on their very first date together, and it wasn't going very well. It wasn't going badly, it was just really, really awkward. They just were not meshing at all. And so as they're getting ready to leave and retire for the night, the guy is thinking to himself, I have nothing to lose here. We're probably not gonna go on a second date. And he says to the woman, hey, do you wanna not go home right now and actually come on a hike with me? And he goes, I know this sounds like a terrible idea, but hear me out. I go mountain climbing in this area called Provo Canyon. It's not that far from here. There are these beautiful trails that lead up the side of the canyon to these amazing scenic overlooks. And tonight it's a new moon, so there's great visibility. And I just think that you might enjoy it. And so at first, the woman is obviously a little bit hesitant. But when he says, look, I go hiking there at night all the time. I love it out there. And I promise if there's any weirdness, if you don't like being there, we'll just turn around and leave. It's totally safe. And so after a little bit of coaxing, she finally says, okay, you know what? That sounds fun. Let's go do it. And so their date that had been really awkward suddenly became really exciting. And the two of them were kind of like thrilled, like, wow, look at us making our way up for a nighttime hike through Provo Canyon. And so they arrive at the, the mouth of this canyon and they're both obviously excited and they hop out and they start walking up this trail that brings them into a heavily forested section of the canyon. Now to this point- Yo, the only way I'm ever gonna do this as a date is if like it's the fifth, sixth, seventh date. That's the only way. Like when you know them, but no, no, no. A date when you're in the, the relationship, you know them well. Point, the guy felt like this was a really great idea. He really had gone hiking here a bunch and he really did know the area well. But as the trail brought them into the forested area, the guy remembers feeling this overwhelming sense of dread. He didn't know why, it was just like an overwhelming sense of anxiety that something bad was going to happen to them. Daddy but he had worked so hard to convince his date to come with him and had convinced her it was safe that he's not about to let on to her that there was anything wrong with what they were doing. And so he put on, you know, his strong- Yo, this is where you need to get some balls, bro. Cause I have no problem saying to a date, yo, I'm out of here. <laughs> I got no problem saying that, bro. Why, why, why do people feel embarrassed for like actually expressing themselves, bro? Like, yo, if I'm on a first date, I don't give a fuck. If I feel unsafe, I'm gonna be like, yo, I, <laughs> yo, I don't like this place, I'm going home. You know what I mean? I don't give a fuck. 
if, if something's if something's tingling in my balls that's saying get out of there, I'm getting out of there, man. I I don't I don't need to feel like I'm the big bad man, you know, the, the protective man. I don't give a fuck. Long face and just kind of suppressed it and just kept on walking and you know holding her hand tight and they just continued their walk. But his sense of dread would just build and build to the point where he was really on edge. Yo, just and what go. What he didn't know, but would find out later, is that his date, the woman, she also had this horrible sense of dread as soon as they went into the forest. But she didn't want to tell him because she didn't want to seem like a party pooper because he seemed really excited about it. At some point, as they're walking down this path, the man steps on something that felt soft. He didn't know what it was, but it caused him to freeze immediately. And he's holding her hand. He kind of jerks her to get her to stop. And before he can even look down and see what he's standing Somebody. on, he hears rustling coming from the bushes just off the trail. She hears it too. And both of them, without saying a word to each other, because again, you got to remember, they're both really stressed. They haven't let on to the other how stressed they are, but they're both basically ready to leave. And so the two of them turn around and they hightail it out of there. He has no idea what he stepped on. They don't know what they heard in the bushes, but they don't care. The anxiety was so how high, would you not see? they just wanted to leave. Years later, that man and woman who had this very strange date would actually be married. And they'd be sitting down watching TV. Well, that was a good fucking date. Then if they ended up married, that was a good fucking date together and they're flipping through the channels and they land on an interview with a death row inmate. And the interviewer is asking the inmate, was there ever a time that you were almost caught red handed? And the guy being interviewed says, yes, one time. I was in the forest up in Provo Canyon one night oh, and a young shit. couple came walking up the trail. I didn't see him. So I only had a chance to jump into the bushes right next to the trail. And oh, the guy shit. actually stepped on the body of a girl I had just killed. But for some reason, he didn't look down and see what he was standing on. And the two of them didn't notice me just a few feet away from them. They just turned around and walked away. Turns out that young couple had run into one of the worst serial killers of all time. Yo, 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 wait, 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 wait. How do you step on a body and not know you stepped on a body? How do you step on a body and not know you stepped on a body, bro? I feel like I'll know. Sometimes it's bad to not know. You think they knew it was dead but just didn't want to know what was dead and just turned away? Ted Bundy. Before Bundy was oh, executed, shit, it was he Bundy? confessed to serial killers of all time. Ted Bundy. Before Bundy was executed, he confessed to over 30 murders. But many people believe the true number of victims is much, much, much higher. Holy so that's going to do it, fuck. guys. Let me know what you thought of these three stories in the comments section. And let me know how you would respond if it turned out. Crazy.